To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Glory to the newborn King. His name is Wonderful Counselor, and he is our mighty God. Glory to the newborn King. Our everlasting Father, our Prince of perfect peace. Glory to the newborn King. His kingdom of peace will fill the earth from now and forevermore. Your sky. Cause you're a sky for the stars I'm gonna give you my heart Cause you're a sky, cause you're a sky for the stars yeah. Cause you light up the path I don't care
You know, the word behold isn't one that we use very much, but it just means to see, to come and see. This King for the broken, this image of love, Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. You know, with every passing year, every passing Christmas, um, there's a chapter in our life that seems to come to a close, right? And this last year has been especially a tough one for my family. This weekend marks one year since my dad went on to be with the Lord. And chances are, if I were to go around the room and we passed a mic or were able to grab a cup of coffee, each of our lives in some way this year are filled with some epic highs and some epic lows, right? Some moments of incredible joy and moments of incredible pain. What a gift is it that we can join as the family of God and celebrate Emmanuel, a God who is with us at Christmas. How many of you can be excited about about that and celebrate with us this Christmas. I'm telling you, 
I think the worship team had a little something extra, a little something extra on them in this service. Typically, I don't catch myself dancing in worship, but my feet were moving. I'm like, man, I am excited to be here. Well, hey, if it's your first time here, we're especially glad that you're here as well. Uh, hopefully, you got a worship guide on your way in. Two things I want to point out in there to you, the first of which is a note sheet. Man, I'm so excited about the message God's got in store for us today. I'd encourage you to take some notes on that paper, maybe on your phone that you can revisit later. Also in there is a connect card. If you're new here to the church, sometime over the next 45 minutes or so, I encourage you to fill that out. I'll let you know where you can drop it off before we leave. We'll be getting started in just a minute, but before we do, why don't you turn to your neighbor, let them know that Pastor Josh wears a 10 and a half in shoes in case they're still questioning what they should get for Christmas. And uh, we'll be getting started in just a minute. So anyway, uh, thanks for listening. I haven't done this in, wow, years, uh, since I was a kid, really. So, you know, sorry if I'm a little bit out of practice, not really saying the right things. Um, honestly, and you know, obviously I know I need to be honest with you. Um, sometimes I'm not even sure if I, you know, believe. I hope that's okay to say. Um, I, I just really needed to talk, but you know, I feel so much better. Uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. Part of me coming here today felt like maybe I shouldn't even be here. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Please leave. Hey, uh, while we're waiting, um, why don't we just change our focus for a minute and let's worship together. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, Sing that again. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. I am so sorry. Thank you guys so much for helping me out. Can you guys thank our worship team for bailing a pastor out? My first time doing Christmas Eve. And <clears throat> so, have you ever not been where you were supposed to be? <laughs> ever happened to you? Me, me neither. No, I can think of times that I wasn't where I was supposed to be. Uh, when I think about that, I think about Growing up in Northern Illinois, I grew up as a diehard Chicago sports teams fan, any of them. I love them all, but especially the, 
the 2018 NFC North Division champion, Chicago Bears. Uh, loved the Bears growing up, so yes, got some Bears fans in here. And uh, we lived about 90 miles away from Chicago. So I, can, I remember the day that my dad came to us and said to my brother and I, hey, we're going to our first Bears game. It's 1985, by the way, Monsters of the Midway. This is, this is a big deal. This is, this is our, our best year yet to date. And so we get in the car and, and we gear up, right? And we got all of our Chicago Bears paraphernalia and we're in the car, about a 90 minute drive to the stadium. And we get to the stadium and we get a spot right in, right in front of the stadium. I'm thinking, it is nice growing up as a pastor's kid. Like, you just have favor that the rest of you don't. I'm thinking, it is like, <laughs> it's just great. And so we, we get there and we get out of the car and we go to the, the ticket office and, and there's no line. I mean, it's just like amazing. A few people here and there, but no line whatsoever. And dad goes up and he has a little conversation with the guy there. Then he comes back and it, it turns out that the Bears did in fact play a game that day. It just wasn't a home game. <clears throat> we were not where we were supposed to be, and uh, it, was, it was tough. You may have had a moment like that, probably didn't require as much therapy to get over as mine, uh, but, but have you ever had that happen? Maybe you were new to a college or new to a school. You show up to a classroom, and, and, and you go to the wrong room. You're not where you're supposed to be. I've heard some stories around here of some blind dates. Some of y'all showed up to a blind date, and you got to the table and you started a conversation only to realize this was not the right table. Uh, and, and you know, uh, so cra crazy stuff like that happened. I know there are many of you uh, who are watching right now at one of our overflow rooms during this service and you're thinking to yourself, I am not where I'm supposed to be. I came 30 minutes early and nobody told me that at this service it was still not gonna be early enough and, and you're not, you feel like you're not where you're supposed to be. We're glad you're here anyways. Also wanna welcome all of you who are joining us at one of our 13 campuses. We're so glad to have you guys with us as well. Some of you are going, you know what? In church is where I'm not supposed to be. Some of you are here today and you're thinking to yourself, this is the last place I should be. You know, if you, if you knew my story, you'd know that I don't belong here. And I can relate to that, by the way. I did grow up as a preacher's kid, but there were many, many Christmases that I was in this room and didn't feel like I belonged here because I was running away from everything to do with God. Now I'm up here, so be careful what might happen uh, to you. But, but we can all relate to that, not being where we're supposed to be in kind of some of the smaller, more minimal consequence sort of ways. But, but for some of us, we're in a season right now where we would go, you know what, I am not where I thought I would be. My career, I mean, my financial situation, for some of us it's a relationship that you thought, man, I always figured that by now I would be married. Or maybe for you it's I figured that I would still be married at this point and, and stuff has happened and I find myself, I'm not where I thought I would be. What do you do when you're not where you're supposed to be? You know, we've come to gather together on Christmas Eve to, to look at the Christmas story to look at the story of the birth of Jesus. And I, I think if once we got past some of the, you know, the, the, the crafts and the, the cute pictures with the soft light and some of that stuff, I think once we get past some of that, you would realize that there's a young couple, Mary and Joseph, who was not where they thought that they would be at all. You know, they, they were betrothed to be married years ago and, and yet now they find themselves in this position where they are not where they thought they would be, certainly the birth of Jesus didn't happen where anybody expected that it would happen. What can we learn from that story? What I wanna do today is look at that story because I believe the birth of that baby, Jesus, can bring with it some promises that we can hang on to in our lives regardless of where we might be. Some of us are exactly where we thought we'd be or we're not where we thought we'd be in the best sort of ways, and that's fantastic. Others of us aren't where we thought we would be and. And, and it's, it's in kind of some tough ways. But either way, I think we can learn some stuff from the Christmas story. The first thing that I notice when I look at it is that sometimes we aren't where we thought we'd be. Sometimes we aren't. We're all in the same boat. Have you ever had a how did I get here moment? Any of you guys ever, ever been there where you're like, how in the world did this happen? Well, Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. They probably had a photographer, you know, hiding out in the bushes taking pictures, getting a selfie right, you know. They probably had planned and, and, and dreamed about where they might live and how many children that they might have and, and, and what their life was going to look like. But all of that changed in a moment for them when an angel showed up and turned their world upside down. Let's look at it. Luke 1, verse 28 and 29. 
It says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. And look at her reaction. Confused and disturbed. Confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think, what, what, what could this angel mean? She, she definitely was not where she felt like she was supposed to be. So how do we get there in these moments? How, how do we end up in places where we never thought we'd be? I think there are a few reasons for us. Some of us, and oftentimes, it's, it's because of a, a choice that I made. It's a consequence of a choice that I made. Ends up landing me in a place where I never thought I would be. I don't know if you've ever regretted a decision that you've made. I can think of several for me. Uh, I was moving about five years ago and had a friend of mine come to help me move. And as we were moving, he was telling me all about this new investment opportunity that, that he wanted me to be a part of. And it was this blockchain, cryptocurrency stuff and talking about Bitcoin and mining for all this. And I mean, he, he went on and on and on for like 45 minutes about it. And finally, I was like, dude, you keep doing your video game thing. I'm gonna kind of do my normal uh, thing with my finances. And, and how many of you know I would be in a different place financially if I would have listened to him five years ago? I regret that decision. So many times in my marriage, I've ended up not where I thought I should be because I either said something that I shouldn't have or didn't say something or buy something when I should have. By the way, Christmas is tomorrow, men, just in case you're, you're wondering. You got some elbows kind of flying. But we can all relate to making choices that we regret. Some of us are, are dealing with consequences of choices that we made. Maybe you've made a choice that's cost you a job, cost you finances, cost you a marriage, or cost you a relationship, and you know what that feels like. When I, when I make those choices and deal with those consequences, oftentimes it leads me to feelings like guilt, regret, frustration, dealing with the consequences. Good news is if you have made a choice that you regret, you are in good company. Look at Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody Look down your aisle. The people who look like they have it together, they've sinned and fallen short. We're all in the same boat. It's a level playing field as far as that goes. So welcome to good company if you've, if you've ever made. Maybe some of you are in the middle of that right now. Sometimes that's what happens. Other times, though, it's, it's not that it, I made a choice. Sometimes it's because someone else wasn't where they were supposed to be. Somebody else wasn't where they were supposed to be. You know, for some of us, there were moments where someone we needed, someone that we were depending on, weren't where they were supposed to be. And it left us feeling abandoned. Maybe for some of us it left us feeling confused. It can be awkward when someone's in charge and they're not where they're supposed to be. A few moments ago, as the lights came up on the platform and I didn't come out, did you feel the room change? <laughs> did you feel the uncomfortable, like awkward nature of the room? Because when people aren't where they're supposed to be, it can impact everybody. It can impact an entire family. It can impact an entire church. And some of you know what that's like, to, to have a parent not be where they were supposed to be, maybe walk out in a time where you needed them the most. Some of you have had a spouse or loved one that's, that's walked out that wasn't where they were supposed to be, and as a result of that, you find yourself dealing with things that you were never meant to deal with, never thought that you would be dealing with. Some of you are wondering now, did they do that on purpose? What, what's going on here? I don't know, you have to come to the next service to find out. <laughs> but when a person who's in power, uh, who should have been there to protect you, and instead takes advantage of you, it can lead you to feel feelings like abandonment, mistrust, fear about the future, kind of an instability that can come. So sometimes it's choices I made, oftentimes it's somebody else wasn't where they were supposed to be, Occasionally, it's because God wasn't where we thought he should be. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt let down by God? That can be one of the hardest ones to deal with. Maybe for you, this is the first time you've been in church in a long time because there was a moment in life where God wasn't where you needed him to be and you left and you never looked back. And you know, when I'm dealing with my own decisions and consequences, I can own up to that, I can repent, I can, I can move past that. When somebody else does something to me or wasn't there, I can learn to forgive, I can let go, I can move past it. But when God wasn't where he was supposed to be, that's a whole lot more challenging to deal with. How do you handle that when God's not where he's supposed to be? Stuff like illnesses, cancer, 
unexpected loss of a loved one. There's nobody to blame except for God. Be honest with you, I've felt some of these emotions in the last couple of months as our family has dealt with several different health scenarios. First with my mother-in-law that ended up with a major surgery and it's like of all people, God, why? You know, how's this going on? And as soon as we got past that one, we get hit with another one, cancer, in our family that we're having to deal with. And I would be lying if there weren't times that I was crying out to God saying, God, where are you in this? What's going on here? So when God's not where he, we thought he should be, it can, it can create feelings similar to what Mary had. Confusion, not sure what's going on, disturbed, can be challenging. I believe that's where Mary was. She's a teenage girl and I'm sure she had issues like every teenager does. But this wasn't one of them, right? The pregnancy, like that wasn't her issue. God did that. Try explaining that to a first century Jewish audience. As a, as a young teenage girl. She's dealing with this unexpected situation. She's not where she thought she would be, and it's, it's God's fault. So, so oftentimes, we aren't where we thought we would be. A second thought for us, it gets better, it's a little more hopeful and cheerful, it's Christmas season, is that God probably views your situation differently than you do. God probably views your situ situation differently than you do. You may not be where you thought you would be, but God has a different perspective. Look what he says to Mary. The, the, go back to that same verse we read earlier. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. Did you catch that? Hey, hey, favored woman, God is with you, chosen one. Mary's like, who, who do you think you're talking to? Like, she's confused. Maybe the thing that was most confusing and disturbing is the fact that that's what the angel said to her. What do you mean? Why would I be a favored woman? See, it's easy for us to look at this from our seat and kind of go, well, I see. I mean, Mary's celebrated, right, in our, our faith, and, and we honor her as one of the great women of our, of our faith, but that wasn't her perspective at the time. She was just an ordinary girl from Nazareth, a poor, uneducated girl who was betrothed to be married. How many Old Testament Jewish women do we know who were chosen by God to do great things for him? Not, not very many, actually. And then of those women, how many were young? And then on top of that, they were poor. The, the list gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We just did a series at the church called Bearing Christmas, and we looked at a few of these women, but there weren't very many examples for Mary to look to to go, I'm the kind of person that God's looking for to use in a powerful way. See, for Mary, the words favored women what was so foreign to her up upbringing. The idea that God was with her was, would have turned her world upside down. God was with educated leaders of the synagogue, not with an uneducated girl from Nazareth. God was with the wealthy people in the culture. He wasn't with a, a, a poor girl who had nothing to give back. God was with the priests of the temple. He wasn't with a pregnant teenage girl. She was confused. She was disturbed. You know, here's the deal. She was confused, but let's be clear. God was not confused. God knew exactly what was happening, and he knew exactly what he was doing. And you don't have to be a young, uneducated girl from Nazareth to think that your experience, your history, maybe your societal value disqualifies you from being used by God. Maybe you, you, you always felt maybe neglected or your family wasn't supportive of you and, and, and you, you're just convinced that God doesn't want to really know you. Maybe like me, you've done some things in your past and you've wondered if the mistakes from your past have, have some, in some way kind of distanced yourself from being able to be used by God. For some of us, maybe you've rededicated your life so many times to God, and every time you do it, there's this habit, this hurt, this hang up that keeps on creeping back in, and you almost wonder if God's given up on you. Can I encourage you? He hasn't. Mary wasn't favored because of what her resume said about her. She wasn't favored because of what she had done up to that point in life. She was favored because of what God was getting ready to do in her life. What if the things that we've gone through, maybe the pain that we're walking through, what if it's a setup for God to do something incredible in your life? That's what he did with her, and I believe in a lot of ways he wants to do the same thing with us. So sometimes 
we're not where we thought it would be. You know, God probably views your situation differently than you do. Last thought for us as we look at this story. The truth is God is always right where he's supposed to be. The truth is God is always right where he's supposed to be. That is the message of Christmas. Isaiah 7, 14 says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Friends, that is the beauty of the Christmas story. God is always exactly where he's supposed to be. And, and guess what? It's with us. He came as a baby. He could have just led from afar, but he came because he wanted to draw near and he wanted to be with humanity. He, he could have saved us in so many different ways, but he did it in such a relational way. In the end, we might not be where we thought we'd be, but I believe that today, right here, right now, every single one of us is exactly where we need to be, here in this place. Believe that God is right where he's supposed to be, here in this place, and that the circumstances are just right for us to connect with him and to meet with him. God is here, God is here. I was thinking about that concept of God being with us. I was reminded of a rafting trip that I took, whitewater rafting. Have any of you ever done that, been whitewater rafting? I went a couple of years ago with some friends. A couple of our campus pastors actually were with us as well. And we got up to the mountains and we were trying to figure out where to go and which you know, kind of tour, tour to go with. And we stopped in and we talked to some travel agents. And what a travel agent does, and some of you are travel agents and uh, really appreciate travel agents, they will tell you about an experience. You go in, and I remember going in, and they were like, hey, here's the deal. We've had a little bit light, lighter rain than we've had in years past, and so the water levels are at such and such level, and uh, this, this river usually is class three and class four, but now it's class two and class three, and blah, 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 blah. I don't know what you're talking about. Just tell me where to go, right? Uh, but, but they'll tell you what to do, and that's good. Like for like my honeymoon, I don't want you coming with me. I just want you to tell me where to go. If, if you wanna be told about a great experience, you go to a travel agent. But if you want someone to take you on an experience, you need a guide. You need a guide, and that's what happened on this rafting trip. We got to the, the tour place, and, and this guide got on the boat with us, and he took us down the river. And what a guide does is they're with you. They're in the boat. They tell you, you know, at, this, at times, like, hey, everybody on the right, row, 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 on the left, back, back, back. Hey, rest, like it's time to chill. You can, you can hang out. And then they'll talk to you about the, the upcoming rapids. It's like, hey, this next one is Sharpshooter Sally, and this is amazing, and then we follow that with, with Hell's Gate, and you're like, why is it called Hell's Gate? Well, because 18 people died on it this year, but it's awesome, we're gonna go through, you know, they're, they're like, but they're all in, like they're heavily invested in this experience, and they wanna take you with it. And I think about that, I think about God, he came with us, he's in the boat, he's willing to get in the boat and go with you, and there may be times that you don't even realize it, but he's, he's He's working his paddle from, from a place where you can't see, where he's guiding you and directing you. And you may end up in places where you didn't think you would be there, where you're not supposed to be. But when God is in your boat, he's like, hey, I get it. We're not supposed to be here, but I know the way home from here. I, I know how to get us out of this. I know, I know how to walk through this with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. When God is in your boat, he brings purpose to your pain, and he never wastes a circumstance. I love the next verse on the outline sheet. It's probably one of the most known verses in the Bible, but also probably one of the most misunderstood. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say all things work out the way I want it to, no. Mary would have scripted this a lot differently. Most of us would have scripted parts of our life a lot differently. Doesn't say that. It doesn't say that all things are gonna have a happy ending here on earth. That's not the promise. Here's what it does say. It says we know. We don't hope, we don't guess, we don't wonder. It says we know. We can be confident of this truth. It says we know that God causes in other words, there's a grand designer. Your life is not just chance. Stuff doesn't happen just by fate. It doesn't say that God causes everything, but it says that he causes things to work together. He is at work designing and redirecting our lives. We make mistakes, God doesn't. 
but he will weave them into his plan. He says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. All things, what are all the things? Is it just the promotion, you know, the blessing, the financial windfall? No, he works those things together too. But it says all things. That includes the cancer. That includes the loss, the miscarriage, the divorce. That includes the mistake, the the way that we blew it. He takes all of the things, it says, and he works them together for good. It doesn't say all things are good, but it does say that when, when, when you mix them together with someone who knows what they're doing, with the creator, that he will weave them into something beautiful. I brought some ingredients here with me. I don't know if any of you guys have had much experience eating some of this. I've got here some, um, some flour. Have you guys ever tasted that? I have. That's, that's not good, I probably shouldn't have done that. It's dry. It's nasty. Let's throw that in the bowl here. And then I've got here some sugar. This is much better. You have had, had sugar? Yeah, we're using all of that. Throw that thing in. By the way, some of the ingredients that we're going through right now are good. Some of you are in a great place. You're not where you thought you would be in the best kind of a way. Man, that is fantastic. That's my prayer, honestly, for everyone in this church next year. I'd much rather that, but, but that's great. You put it in the bowl. I've got some baking powder. Anybody ever tasted that? I'm not going to. <laughs> nice. I gotta preach, I gotta, I gotta finish this message, but throw that in there. Got some, uh, some butter. Have you guys ever just tried butter on its own? I did this as a kid. Like, butter makes everything better, right? But man, when you just bite into it, it's nasty. I'm gonna throw a little bit of that in there. I've got an egg here. Any of you guys like raw eggs? Got any bodybuilders in the house? Some of you guys do that? It's nasty. I've tried it before. Not an enjoyable experience, but I'm gonna throw it in here a little bit. And here's the deal, when you take these ingredients, any one of them on their own, they're not that great, but when you put them all together and then you have somebody who knows what they're doing, they begin to mix it together, right? And they know kind of when to put it in the oven and how long to leave it there and what to do with it. You end up having all of these random ingredients that on their own aren't great, but when you put them together, they create something beautiful. In fact, I brought, I brought kind of the result of some of this. It's a Christmas cookie, right? These things are good. Just taste a little bit of that. Solid, solid. We had a, a, at my dad's house the other day, all the kids came together. We did a Christmas cookie decorating contest. Dad posted pictures to Instagram. A lot of you voted on that. I wanna say thank you for contributing to the insecurities of my children. <laughs> Every morning, Dad, how many votes did I get? Where am I at? <laughs> Gosh, what are we doing to you guys? But, um, but man, we all love a good Christmas cookie, right? I mean, we all love a good Christmas cookie. We may not like the ingredients, but we like what, what they become after they're in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing. And I think you get the metaphor. I don't know what ingredients you're walking through right now. I don't know what kind of challenges you're facing right now. But if you would be willing to put your life, put those ingredients into the hands of a loving God who knows what to do with them, who knows how to weave things together into his plan. I believe he wants to create something beautiful out of it. I believe that he can take even the darkest parts of our lives, and some of those wounds take time to heal, but they end up becoming scabs, and then they become scars, and then they become something beautiful that God will use, not only in your own life, but for others. God takes all things. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good, but there is one qualifier for those who love God, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. This is not a promise for everybody. This is a specific promise. God doesn't work all things together for the good of those who thumb their nose at him and walk away from him. You know, this is a promise that's for believers, for all who love him and are called according to his, who, who's called according to his purposes? I would say every single one of us in this room can check that off the list. It is not God's desire that any one of his children would perish. 
He calls all of us. He woos us to himself. Some of you are even feeling that in this moment, that this draw from a loving father that says, I love you, I wanna be with you, that's what Christmas is about. Some of you go, well, I don't know if I can say I love God. You know, it starts with a decision. Much like a marriage starts with the choice that you make. There are times you feel it, times that you don't, but it starts with the decision. Say, God, I wanna trust you with my life. I wanna give you my life. I wanna become a believer in you. And if you'll do that, he'll take the ingredients of your life and he will give purpose to your pain. I love Jeremiah 29, 11, the promise he made to Israel back in the Old Testament, but he, he makes it to us as well. I know what I'm planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I'll give you a hope and I'll give you a future. So friends, when we find ourselves in a place we aren't supposed to be, oftentimes in hindsight, we realize we were right where we needed to be. You know, in the bigger picture, Mary and Joseph, they were right where we needed them to be. Thank God that they said yes, that they carried hope so that we could now all experience hope. What if you're right where God needs you to be right now? Sitting in church on Christmas Eve, the pain that you've experienced, the difficulty maybe that you face is just a setup for you to invite him into your boat, to be a part of your story, to take over your story. At the end of the day, when you're not where you're supposed to be, it can be awkward, it can be uncomfortable, but I love what happened earlier in our service. When, when I didn't show up and it was awkward and uncomfortable, I love that Tara and Brandon came out and what did they say? They said, while we're waiting, let's worship. And some of you, while you're waiting for your circumstances to change, and while you're waiting for that breakthrough, what if we took our eyes off of our circumstances and we put them on God? We said, God, we wanna worship you and experience your presence today. We're gonna do that together in a moment. Would you guys pray with me? Why don't we bow our heads and pray as we close? And as we do close, I just wanna give an opportunity. I'm gonna pray for a lot of us. A lot of us are going through circumstances. A lot of us are just needing to experience the, the hope promise of God's hope during this season. But if you're here today and you would say, you know what I wanna do? I wanna give my life to Christ. I wanna invite God into my boat. Maybe you're experiencing some ingredients right now that are bitter or dry, challenging. And you say, I wanna put those ingredients, I wanna put my life into the arms of a loving God who will work them together for good. I wanna give you an opportunity to say yes to him. So I'm gonna pray and if you want me to include you in that prayer, I'm just gonna ask you to just raise your hand as all the heads are bowed and kind of give privacy to this moment. But if you'd say, Josh, I want you to pray for me here or at the campuses, just raise your hand right now. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm looking to my right. Fantastic, fantastic. Here in the middle section, anybody say yeah, include me in that? Okay, awesome, great, great. What about here on my left, uh, your right? Okay, awesome, awesome. Up in the balcony, anybody say, yeah, Josh, include me on that, okay, cool, that's great, great. It's a simple saying, God, I give you my life. So God, I give you my life. We give you our lives. Jesus, we, we thank you for coming. We thank you that you didn't lead from afar, but that you came on earth as a baby in humility. You served, you lived a sinless life and ultimately you went to the cross so that we wouldn't have to carry the guilt of our sin, the shame, the condemnation. So we give our life to you. God, we ask you to take it all, take every ingredient, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and that you would weave it together and do something significant, do something great in my life. Use me in a powerful way. God, I pray for this entire church, for this entire family. We just pray, God, that you would, would make your presence known to us today. That in all of the craziness of Christmas, that we wouldn't miss the fact that you are here, that you're in our lives, that you came, that you've never left and you never will. So we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We celebrate and give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, we're gonna respond to God. If you're new to Seacoast, we love to take just a few minutes in our service and before we rush out to whatever's next for you, just to reflect, what's God saying to you today? What's he saying to you? And then what would you do to respond? 
You know, there are crosses on either side of the platform. There's one up in the balcony as well. And maybe you're here and you're going through some difficult circumstances right now. And, and some of you raised your hand. Maybe you didn't, but you want to just go to the cross and, and take a piece of paper and a pencil and, and maybe just write down whatever that circumstance is, whatever that ingredient that you're walking through right now, whatever's weighing heavy on your heart, and pin it up on the cross. And just, just think of yourself as, as placing your life, your circumstances into the arms of a loving God who's gonna take it, who's gonna work it together for something good. Others of us are gonna go to the candles and the candles at Seacoast, we use them just as a way to pray. Maybe you know somebody, you love somebody who's not where they're supposed to be right now, walking through a difficult circumstance, maybe running away from God right now and, and just go to the candles and light a candle and pray for them. If God hasn't given up on them, then, then we're not gonna give up on them either, right? We're gonna believe, we're gonna pray in faith that God would work all things together in their life. We have prayer teams that are on the back walls and if there's anything that you're going through right now that you just need to be prayed for, you need, you need healing or maybe a breakthrough in some area, we'd love to pray for you and that. We have communion stations that are set up throughout both in the balcony and down here on the floor. And again, communion just as a reminder that Jesus came, that he lived a sinless life, and that he died on a cross, poured out his life for us, for the sins of, of humanity, for your sin, for my sin. And we just come and receive and, and thank him for what he's done. And then we're gonna worship. We're gonna take our eyes off of our own stuff for a moment, and we're gonna worship, and we're gonna sing, and we're gonna celebrate an awesome God who loves us so much. So what's God saying to you? And let's respond to him together.
sing praises ring to the newborn king peace on earth he with us joy awakening at his feet we
You know, 200 years ago tonight, in a German village, a small chapel, a priest brought an acoustic guitar. It was an acoustic because they hadn't discovered electricity yet. And began to lead the song that we're going to sing in just a minute. It has become um, the favorite Christmas carol all over the world. Silent Night. Why, why, is it, why, why does it strike something in us, especially as we light candles together? You know, I was thinking about candles, and candles are about as low-tech as they come, aren't they? Any of you have technology under your tree, don't raise your hand, the kids are with you right now. But you know what, in a high-tech age, it's nice sometimes just to go, let's quiet down, let's slow down, and let's remember what Christmas is about. We've sung about it, we've heard a message about it, and now we're gonna light candles together, signifying that Jesus is the light of the world. A lot of things on your mind, a lot of preparations for tomorrow, but for right now, Jesus is the light of the world. And wherever there's light, it dispels darkness. You go into a dark room and you light a candle and the room is no longer dark. Dim, yes, dark, no. And there may be dark places, maybe in your life or in your family or your friends, and as we, um, as we light this candle, and we're, we're gonna light for our pastors and leaders and they're gonna come and light you, but as you're waiting, maybe you just wanna look at a candle and, and think about the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. You may wanna even whisper a prayer. You know, we're facing some kind of dark stuff. Would you light that up? You're the light of the world, okay? We're gonna sing together. So let's, let's light our candles and we'll sing and participate together. Christmas again. Let's 
sing, Oh, come, let us adore him. You alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy. For you alone are worthy. Lord, we are grateful to you for your generosity to us in giving your son, Jesus Christ, to come and, and to be our guide, to die for us and then to rise again that we might have eternal and everlasting life. We're so grateful for that. God, we're grateful for the power that there is in the light. God, I pray right now for any of us who maybe this is a darker season or maybe we're looking next year at some things that, that look like they could be challenging. We ask that the light of Jesus would be brought to bear on every circumstance. We're grateful for the light that chases the darkness and makes way for us. And so I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This is so beautiful. I always hate to blow the candles out, but I think we probably better. And so on the count of three, let's do it together. One, two, three. <laughs> That's great. Well, hey, what a special... Afternoon, so glad that you are here to uh, worship and celebrate Christmas with us. You know, a lot of our plans and preparation for this night are all pointing towards January. We've got a great service planned next week. We kick off a new series in January, and oftentimes the, uh, the series that we kick off the year with in a lot of ways kind of sets the foundation for the work that God does in my life that year. It's one of my favorite series, and I wanted to give you a little sneak peek as to uh, this January's series. So take just a minute and check this out. That's what I'm talking about. Some of y'all didn't know a white boy had rhythm like that, did you? He was moving. He was working. My feet started going, I'm telling you. Well, listen, how many of you would say you want 2019 to be better than 2018? All right? Amen. Well, listen, just as Pastor Josh taught us today, God has good things in store for you. So we're going to spend a couple weeks looking at how we can best align our lives with his plan for us. So we hope you'll join us for that. Also, take the paperwork that was on your chair as you came in. It's kind of laying out all of the ministry programming as we kick off a new year. So take that with you, read it over the next week or two. I hope that you'll take a step to join us in community. If you came prepared today to give a year-end gift or tithes or offerings, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could text to give, you could give online at seacoast.org, or you can drop it off in an offering box as you leave. As you walk out, if you wouldn't mind, take those candles with you. You could take them home or you can drop them off in a basket there outside the exit doors. Just don't leave them on the seat for us. Will you bow with me for the blessing? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. 
To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.